Thanks, James. Good morning. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a great privilege uh, to be the servant of the servants of the Lord, and I'm very grateful for the uh, opportunity that I've had to uh, share in this way. It's been a great joy. Uh, well, the whole Christian life is an exercise in being in between. And being in between isn't easy. Uh, when a young couple are preparing to be married, it's not easy to be between engagement and the wedding. There's so much to get ready and plan for, but the real substance of sharing life together and building a future has to wait. When you are between graduation and your first job, it's not easy. So much learning and study and practice has taken place, but doing the job and getting your first pay packet is still in the future. The rewards are yet to be experienced, though all the qualifying steps may have been completed. And the whole Christian life is an exercise in being in between, between resurrection and ascension and return. And it's not easy. On the one hand, we know the forgiveness of God and the indwelling of the Spirit, but we have not yet finally done away with our old habits of self-centeredness. On the one hand, we have a heavenly citizenship, a room prepared for us in the Father's mansion, a place at the wedding feast of the Lamb. On the other hand, we still live here, where death and sin and suffering still wreak their havoc. On the one hand, as chapter 3, verse 13 says, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. On the other hand, as Peter wrote in his first letter, we are aliens and strangers, in exile, away from home, but called to be a blessing to our neighbours and fellow citizens. On the one hand, the world will pass away. On the other hand, we are not careless of the world, but called to live holy and godly lives. In 2 Peter 3, uh, in 2 Peter 3 we hear the uh, last recorded words of the Apostle Peter. He has written with tenderness and concern and urgency to his flock. He wants to remind them of things of first importance. And as the letter closes, he wants to remind them that this world has a use-by date. The Bible is resolute in its teaching that this world will not last. And long before the scientists said, be brave, it's not going to last, the scriptures said, it's not going to last, be ready. So Peter writes uh, in verse 1 of chapter 3 that he wants to stimulate his readers to wholesome thinking. He wants them to be full of life-giving truth, wholesome thinking. He wants them to know what is true. He wants them to love what is true. And he wants them to live in accordance with the truth about the return of Jesus. So I've got three headings this morning. God's word, God's will, godly waiting. God's word, God's will, godly waiting. Firstly, understanding God's word about the day of the Lord. Verses 2 to 7. In chapter 2... Uh, as we saw yesterday, Peter condemns the false teachers because they exploit people by cleverly devised stories and because they have turned their backs on the sacred command. But in contrast, Peter says to his readers in verse 2 of chapter 3, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Saviour, through the apostles. Wholesome thinking comes from meditation on the words of the prophets and the command 
given by our Lord and Saviour through the apostles, what we find today in our Bible. Holy, uh, wholesome thinking comes from meditation on the words of Scripture. Notice that Paul, uh, Peter doesn't say the commands given by our Lord and Saviour and your apostles. He says the command given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles. Peter does not hesitate to claim the authority of Jesus for the message he delivers because it was Jesus who commissioned and called his apostles. It was Jesus who sent them out to be his witnesses. It was Jesus who promised the apostles his Holy Spirit to be their teacher and to remind them of all he had commanded. So in chapter 1, verse 21, the prophets spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And at the end of chapter 3, Peter refers to the letters of Paul as scripture. So when some modern commentators try to put a wedge between Jesus and his apostles and claim that Jesus wouldn't agree with his apostles, but he would agree with the modern commentator... There is something rather ironic and unbelievable about that. The Lord has commissioned, sent, and empowered, and inspired his apostles. And Peter says, I want you to be stimulated. I want you to recall the words spoken by prophet and apostle. Recall the words spoken concerning the day of the Lord. Perhaps he had Isaiah 24, in mind, see the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. No doubt uh, he has in mind the words of the Lord himself. Keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. You must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And so all the apostles agree with the Lord. Paul says our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And James says, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. And John says, we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. Recall the words spoken by prophet and apostle. Recall the words spoken uh, concerning the return of the Lord. Recall the words spoken concerning scoffers. Peter says, you must understand that in the last day, scoffers will come. And we saw yesterday in chapter 2 that he drew attention to those who scoffed at the idea of God's judgment. The citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, Balaam, the seer, people uh, in the days of Noah. Peter says, don't be surprised that there are scoffers. That is what you are to expect. In the last days, scoffers will come. Recall the word of God concerning creation and judgment. Verse 5. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Paul wants to stimulate his readers to wholesome thinking. So he urges them to remember that everything exists by the word of God and answers to the word of God. The scoffers say everything goes on as it has 
since the beginning of creation. In other words, this is a material world. It operates according to immutable laws and time-honored practices and custom. But Peter replies, no, this world is not self-created and self-sustaining. It came into being by the command of God and it is graciously sustained at his command. When we say that the world was created by God's word, we mean that God ordered time and space and matter and what we call natural processes. The world did not spontaneously appear. It is dependent. It is conditional. It is derived. It is accountable. Brought into being by the command of God at the beginning. In the days of Noah, the world was held accountable and judged at the command of God. And the world today is kept, sustained, preserved by the word of God until the day of judgment. Day and night, the seasons, the passing years, birth and death, family life and friendship, marriage and work and leisure and celebration, daily routine and the seasons of human life, They are not inevitable. They are not accidental. They are not self-perpetuating. They are gift. We have them on account of God's gracious and life-giving command. And when God gives the command, the world will end and the day of accounting will come. At one level, of course, the attitude of the scoffers is understandable. They'd started within a few years after the life of Jesus or sooner. And we are still waiting 2,000 years later. But the scoffers are not frustrated about the delay. They follow their evil desires and deliberately forget. That is to say, they deny the return of Jesus and they deny the judgment because it threatens their sinfulness. People like to say, I suppose, how can a good God judge? I don't think I could worship a God who was judging. But of course, that is only a way of saying, I don't want to be judged. I'm not willing to have my life subject to the assessment of God. But in most of the world, only a God who judges could be good and loving. There is too much injustice, too much exploitation, too much misery and violence and cruelty imposed by some on others and often by few on the many. There is far too much evil in the world for a loving God to fail to be a judging God. But the scoffers are not concerned with justice for the weak. They are only concerned for freedom to pursue their own evil desires without accountability. That is why they scoff. They deliberately forget To stimulate his readers to wholesome thinking, Peter reminds them of the word of the prophets and apostles concerning the return of the Lord, concerning the scoffers, concerning creation and judgment itself. They are are to understand the word of God about the return of the Lord. Secondly, they are to understand the will of God about the return of the Lord. They are to understand the will of God about the return of the Lord. Uh, Perhaps it is true that the scoffers scoff out of self-interest. They follow their evil desires and comfort themselves that they have nothing to fear from a judgment that will never come. But the delay in Christ's coming is not only convenient for those who have evil intent, it is very inconvenient for those who long for the Lord's coming and suffer in in the meantime. Since the world is 
full of violence and greed and exploitation and cruelty, isn't it time for the Lord to come as he promised? It's not only scoffers who ask, where is the coming he promised? How long, O Lord, is the cry of the faithful too? So having addressed the complaint of the scoffers, Peter now turns to the cry of the faithful. He has four insights to the delay in the return of the Lord. First, God relates to time in a way that is different than us. Verse 8, do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. God relates to time in a way that is different than us. God is eternal. He sees the end from the beginning. He has numbered each of our days before one of them came to be, the psalmist says. Peter quotes Psalm 90, a psalm about judgment, to say two things about how God relates to time. He has a different perspective than us. A thousand years are like a day. He doesn't experience the delay the way we do. And he has a different engagement than us. A day is like a thousand years. We say our days are busy, crammed full. We can hardly cope with all that goes on in a single day in our own lives, let alone the small circle of people that we care about. But God has complete knowledge of everything that happens on every day. Seven billion stories, as SBS would say. Our hearts would explode if we knew the joys and wonder of a single day. But we would be convulsed with grief if we knew the fullness of the sorrow and suffering and struggle and evil of a day. But God knows it all. And it is all kept and reserved for the day of judgment. Nothing is unnoticed. Nothing will be unaccounted for. A day is like a thousand years. Secondly, God is not slow, but patient, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. If God knows all the evil of every day, why does he not act? Why does he not bring the curtain down on this sad and broken world? Surely the God who is just cannot delay any longer. The Bible says God is not slow as some understand slowness. Not slow to bring justice. But slowness is part of his character. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious one, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. What is he waiting for then? Thirdly, verse 9, verse 9b. God does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is not sphingine, not implacable, not unmoved. God has delayed his judgment in order to give time for his people to repent. In the last days, there will be scoffers who follow their own evil desires, and there will be the repentant. Those who turn from evil desire and trust in the gospel of God's forgiveness through faith in his son. The day of judgment will bring destruction of the ungodly, verse 7 says. But Jesus prayed for the forgiveness even of those who brought about his death. No one is beyond redemption. The ungodly 
who will be destroyed are not those merely who do evil, even the evil of putting Jesus to death, for we are all evil. There is no one good. The godly who will be destroyed, the the ungodly who will be destroyed, are those who do not repent of their evil, who do not turn from their evil desires, whose hearts are not turned to the Lord who made them. Those who are saved are not the godly, but the repentant. And Peter's fourth observation in relation to time and God. The day of the Lord is delayed, but it will not be delayed forever. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It is not delayed because it is not coming. It was promised by prophet and apostle and it will come. It is not delayed because God is slow. No, he is patient, wanting everyone to come to repentance. It is not delayed because God does not care. No, heaven and earth are kept for the day of judgment and everything will be laid bare. It is delayed so that his repentant people may be gathered in. But when it comes, that day will be a day of blistering, comprehensive, catastrophic destruction. Peter's words here are not all that prophet and apostle have to say about the destruction of the heavens that pass away and the coming of the new creation. There is renewal. As we know about this. And there is especially a solid hope for which we are to look a home of righteousness where the lion and the lamb will sit down together. But we should not move lightly or speedily over the weight of this picture of universal devastation that will overwhelm this realm of sin at the coming of the Lord. Understanding God's word about the day of the Lord. Understanding God's will about the day of the Lord. And lastly, understanding godly waiting for the day of the Lord. Understanding godly waiting for the day of the Lord. Verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, What kind of people ought you to be? Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Peter's got three answers to his question. Godly living, gospel proclaiming, growing in grace. Firstly, godly living, he says, live holy lives. There are, of course, a few uh, uh, options answering this question, how shall we live? There is the hedonistic, pleasure-loving, live-for-now response that embraces or at least exploits the world. Everything will be destroyed, so eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. No point saving it for future generations, there may not be any. There is a kind of world-exploiting approach like that. There is a world-rejecting approach too. Everything will be destroyed, so we should have nothing to do with the place now. 
Let's keep a low profile. Let's make ourselves comfortable and safe. No need to worry about the environment, the poor, the children, as long as we're okay until the Lord comes. But Peter's response is not smug, not indifferent, not frantic, not self-indulgent. Verse 11b, you ought to live holy and godly lives. More literally, those words are plural. You ought to live lives full of holinesses and godly deeds. Uh, Not to earn a place in the new creation, but to show that you belong to the age that is coming, that you are a citizen of the new earth where righteousness dwells. How will we live? Lives of many holinesses and many godly deeds. Remember chapter 1, verse 3. I hope you will memorize chapter 1, verse 3. God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. He's given us his power for godly living, his Holy Spirit. So we ought to live holy and godly lives, full of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Let me tell you a story about an Australian Aboriginal man named William Cooper of the Yorta uh, tribe, born in 1860, who grew up in the Maloga Mission on the Murray River as a child. He became a Christian in his 20s. His grandson, Alfred Turner, Uncle Boydie, is still living and recalls that his grandfather was a man who would read his Bible daily and had great confidence in the resurrection, great expectation of the new heavens and the new earth and a great sense of accountability for his life when the judgment came. Cooper has recently uh, gained some uh, profile because in 2008 he was honoured by the State of Israel at their 70th anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night in November 1938, when uh, across Germany, Jewish homes and businesses were trashed and burned. About one month after Kristallnacht, in December 1938, when Cooper was 77 years old, he led what the Jerusalem Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem, Uh, describes as the only citizen's protest anywhere in the world at that time against the treatment of the Jews by the Nazi regime in Germany. And Cooper led a delegation of mainly, uh, of 20 mainly Aboriginal people who marched from his home in Footscray to the offices of the Reichsconsul in Collins Street, Melbourne, which I think is just around the corner, right? (laughs) To present a letter protesting the treatment of the Jewish people by the Nazi government. The Consul General refused to meet the delegation of the Australian Aboriginal League that Cooper had helped create some years earlier. But the protest was reported in the Argus newspaper. In July 1938, an international conference at Evian in Switzerland uh, had met to discuss the issue of Jewish refugees and... Uh, inexplicably, the Australian government had resolved to take none, no Jewish refugees from Germany or Austria to be taken by Australia. But two days after Cooper's protest, the Minister for the Interior, Jack McEwen, announced that Australia had changed its position and would now take 15,000. At the time, Cooper protested the treatment of the Jews in Germany He, along with all other Aboriginal people, were not citizens of Australia and, as you know, would not become so until nearly 30 years after Cooper's death. But he had advocated for the rights of his people since his 20s and, in 1937, presented a petition to the King seeking parliamentary representation for Aboriginal people. In 2010, Cooper's grandson reenacted the march from Cooper's home to the German Consul General. The letter was received. The German government invited his family members to present the letter to the German Chancellor, who held a reception in his honour and offered them a formal apology. 
and the Yad Vashem Museum in Israel has established a professorial chair in Holocaust studies that bears his name. An amazing story of a very ordinary man who was gripped at a young age by the story of the exodus of the Israelites and lived in light of the new heaven and the new earth that he was eagerly looking forward to. A remarkable Australian living the life of an ordinary Christian. He understood being in between. No triumphalist utopia, no miserly withdrawal. Creative, humble advocacy of justice, inspired by God's deliverance of his people and uh, pursued by confidence in the world to come. That's impressive, isn't it? And beautiful. What kind of people ought you to be since everything will be destroyed in this way? Live holy and godly lives. Godly living. Secondly, gospel proclaiming. Verse 12. Look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Peter says in verse 12, look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Verse 13, he says, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Verse 14, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort. And in every place where we read the words looking forward, literally the word is waiting. We don't like waiting. But there's no passivity about this waiting, is there? It's not an irritating delay. It's not a time of boredom and inactivity. It's not that kind of waiting. It's the waiting of a bride-to-be for her wedding day. It's the waiting of an athlete for the sound of the starting gun. It's the waiting of a performer for opening night. As Christians anticipate the day of the Lord, we have an eager expectation and a confident hope. And Peter says, in this time of waiting, eager expectation, speed its coming. Fill up the time with the things that bring it closer. A bride has an eager expectation of her wedding day. She buys a dress. She invites her guests. She plans a celebration. The athlete eagerly anticipates the contest. She trains hard. She perfects her technique. She manages her diet and sleep and exercise. The actor eagerly awaits opening night. He learns his lines. He studies his character. He perfects his manner, his speech and movement. What are the activities to which the Christian devotes themselves to bring the day of God closer as we look forward to the new heaven and the new earth? We look forward to that day because it is the day of justice it is the day of tears wiped away. It is the day of the cries of God's people vindicated. So we look forward to it, though it is a day of terrible destruction. But what are we to do to speed its coming? I think the clue is in verses 14 and 15. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. We fill up the time with the things of salvation. To be found spotless and blameless will mean to be found at peace with him. He is the lamb without spot or blemish. It is reconciled to him through repentance that we will be found at peace. He is our peace. So we are to make sure that we are at peace with him and doing everything we can 
to ensure that others are at peace with him as well. The reason the new creation hasn't come, the reason the day of judgment is held off, is because God is patient, wanting everyone to come to repentance. So we are to ensure that we are people trusting in Christ, repenting of our sin and being found at peace with him. And we are to be people who speed the day of his coming, God's coming by doing everything we can to see other people made at peace with Christ before he comes. What brings people to repentance? Not condemnation of a world under judgment. Not compulsion, if that were possible. Converting at the end of a sword or the point of a gun. Not capitulation, affirming what God does not affirm. What speeds the day of the Lord, the coming of the day of the Lord, is the repentance of God's people. And what produces repentance is the preaching of the gospel. So the gospel must be preached. The Lord says in Matthew 24, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Not until all God's people have been gathered together by the preaching of the gospel so we hasten the coming of that day when we provide for and participate in and pray towards gospel preaching to the nations and our neighbours. How wonderful to spend a few days together praying, planning, encouraging one another to persevere in this great privilege that we have of being those who announce grace and peace in abundance through faith in Jesus Christ and call on those around us to be reconciled to him. And how wonderful that in every place from which we have come and many other places... <laughs> God has established fellowships of those who are his, who receive his word with trust and obedience and gladness and who pray and serve and love those in their communities so that they may see, so that they may glimpse, so that they may hear of the one who saved us by his glory and goodness. That's a calling, isn't it? It is a glorious calling. And by it, we speed the day of the coming of the Lord. Do not falter. Though you are weary, let's hold one another up spur one another on as we speed the day of its coming. Live holy lives, speed the day, and thirdly and lastly, really lastly this time, since everything will be destroyed in this way, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Godly living, gospel proclaiming, growing in grace. The Christian's waiting for the new heavens and the new earth is not a passive, do nothing, sit back kind of waiting. It's a looking forward, straining forward, making every effort, speeding its coming kind of waiting. It's a time of growth, not stagnation. A time of expectation, not resignation. A time of looking forward, holy living, 
not a retreat into a holy huddle. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. This, uh, this growth in grace and knowledge is contrasted with its opposite in verse 17. The opposite of growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord uh, is, verse 17, being carried away by the error of the lawless and falling away. Go back one more verse and we see where this deadly error comes from. Peter writes about the letters of Paul, which he compares to the other scriptures. And he says about the writings of the apostle Paul, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus means grappling even with the hard things of scripture and not being carried away by distortions and error. The beginning of the chapter, Peter said, I want to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want to recall, I want you to recall the words spoken by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord through your apostles. Wholesome, life-giving, Christ-exalting, soul-saving, world-transforming truth comes from the words of the prophets and the apostles. And at the end of the chapter, he commits them to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour. Not to be carried away by error. but to grow in knowledge, to know the truth about Jesus, Lord and Saviour, is to experience grace and peace, acceptance and joy. It is to have his divine power, his Holy Spirit, to live the godly and obedient life. It is to give birth to hope, and eager expectation of the new creation, the home of righteousness. It is to feed stability and assurance. It is to give birth to humility and servant-heartedness. Where do these things come from? From the knowledge of Jesus as Lord and Saviour, whom we meet in the word he has given to prophet and apostle. So we grow in grace. Since everything will be destroyed, what kind of people ought you to be? Living lives of godliness and holiness, not withdrawing from the world in fear or contempt, not exploiting the world in reckless self-indulgence, but showing to the world the life of the world to come, the dwelling place of righteousness. Speeding the day of its coming by making known the gospel of grace, the urgency of repentance, the beauty of the Saviour, the trustworthiness of the Lord growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, not capitulating to error, not compromising with distortion, but recalling the truth spoken by the prophets and apostles. Godly living, gospel proclaiming, growing in grace until we see the day. Amen.